Now, Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations present... Suspense! Tonight, Autolite brings you Ronald Coleman in Noose of Coincidence. A suspense play produced and directed by Anton M. Leder. If you're a fellow who won't put up with second best, what are you waiting for? Replace those old narrow gap spark plugs with wide gap Autolite resistor spark plugs and see the difference in your car. Your car will idle smoother, give you better power and performance on leaner gas mixtures. Actually save gas. Autolite regular type spark plugs have long been standard factory equipment on many leading makes of cars and trucks. And now six, that's right, six of these leading makes of cars and trucks have switched to Autolite resistor-type spark plugs for factory installation on their new 1949 models. The new wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs are the spark plugs of today and the future. Remember, you're right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents Ronald Coleman in a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Do you know London? Do you remember Swan's Bookshop, 12 Edgemont Row? Now, that's it. It's hard to believe that such a quiet, unassuming shop was the scene of unusual, even fantastic happenings. The only thing out of the ordinary about my bookshop, although I feel it's most appropriate, is the sign, or rather symbol, hanging above the door. An arm, made of cast iron, holding aloft a flaming torch. I must confess that the sharp angle inside the elbow attracted some distinctly unbookish creatures. Birds, who found the crook of the arm a splendid place for nest building. I rather liked the birds beneath my bedroom windows, but some of my customers complained quite bitterly about their nesting over the door. So, each spring, it became my wicked task to clear away the little home that was a building and then to try in vain to make peace with the birds and my angry conscience. Well, Mr. Swan, is it spring again? Ah, uh, good morning, Constable. Have a care up there on that ladder, sir. Steady. <laughs> oh, it's not the ladder that's making my knees shaky. It's this monstrous crime I commit every year. But if you didn't, Mr. Swan, how would the rest of us know it was spring, eh? Yes, <laughs> a distinguished career. Christopher Swan, calendar to the neighborhood. And very <laughs> honored, sir, be all of us. Thank you, Constable. Uh, uh, begging your pardon, Mr. Swan, but uh, you have a customer in your shop? I do not. Yes, hmm? I saw him go in while I was halfway down the street. He walked right under the ladder, he did, with never a care. A brave man indeed. Thank you. Good morning. I'm sorry I didn't see you enter. I didn't hear the bell. Uh, may I help you? I don't need help. Your name is Christopher Swan? Yes. Good morning. My name is Christopher Swan. I... Well, forgive me, I, I didn't quite hear... Yeah, but you did. Christopher Swan, sir. Your name, my name. Well, how odd. Why? People must have names. More people than names, therefore duplication. Bound to happen. <laughs> my card. Oh, thank you. Yeah, sure enough. Christopher Swan. Mental telepathist. Telepathist and prophet of the future. Oh. Well, nevertheless, it is very odd. Well, perhaps it is. In that case, you must save my card and show it to Margaret. Margaret? Your wife, sir. Oh, no, I'm afraid you're mistaken. I have no wife, and I've never been married. Do you suppose I'm not aware of that? You are? Well, then I, I don't see how you can... Mr. Swan, mental telepathist and prophet of the future. The future? Yes. Margaret, young woman, pretty too, red hair. Oh, now, really... I read a good bit about extrasensory perception, Mr. Swan, but when you speak of foretelling the future... You don't believe a word of it. Well, I don't blame you. No one believes at first. And later? <laughs> Mr. Swan, suppose we drop the subject. I've come here simply to buy some books. Perhaps we may have a little talk in a short time after your marriage. <laughs> If a thing like that happened to you, you'd probably laugh at it as I did. But then, if only five days later, you met a red-haired girl named Margaret, 
and she was pretty, and the fresh perfume of spring began to engage in mortal combat with the bachelor in you, then you might begin to believe that all nature conspired to fulfill the prophecy of Christopher Swan. Of course I want to marry you, but we know so little about each other. Well, I think that's excellent, Margaret. It'll be an adventure, finding out. Oh, you'll be disappointed in me. There's nothing to find out. I don't intend to try. I expect to be content with you as you are. Well, Margaret? Oh, I... I wish you hadn't told me about all that money you inherited. I'd... I'd like you to believe that I'm marrying you for yourself. Chris, will you be happy with me? Will you be content? Happy with Margaret? Content with Margaret? Less than three months later, anyone with an earshot could have told the answer to that. Christopher! Yes, Margaret, I'm coming. Christopher, this back room is a sight. Yes, Margaret. If only you'd do some tidying about here instead of going on as you do. Talk, talk, talk with the customers, day in, day out. And what do you talk about? Books. Nothing but musty old books. But that's my business, my dear. Well, more's the pity. Why, any man with 50,000 good English pounds in Barclays Bank insists upon running an out-of-the-way little bookshop instead of going out into the world and making something of himself. Margaret, please, there are people in the shop. People? Loafers. Now, see here, Margaret, Don't you... you dare lose that nasty temper with me. I know you're sorry you married me, but you made a bargain. You might as just as well be resigned. Till death do us part, the minister said. Till death do us part. <laughs> One day, I went up to Hampstead Heath for the fair. Oh, not so much to see the fair as to get away from Margaret. I watched the children on the carousels and the pearlies from Lambeth Road and the girls in white smocks selling jellied apples. And then, suddenly, there he was again. Well, sink me. It's my friend, the doubter. How do you do, Mr. Swan? Quite well, thank you. Uh, My question, Mr. Swan, was purely rhetorical. I'm thoroughly aware that you are not doing well at all. Wrong again, Mr. Swan. Now, how can you say again? You did marry a red-haired woman named Margaret, didn't you? You really believe in your powers. Candidly, I don't. The only thing thus far proven is that there are remarkable coincidences. (laughs) My dear Mr. Swan, how the thing happened is quite unimportant. All we must remember is my prediction that it would happen. I didn't say how. (laughs) Could you have done that too? With a little more concentration, why not? (laughs) For instance... Let me tell you about your wife. Your wife, Mr. Swan, is a shrew and will become more of a shrew each day. Now, please, I don't think I care to hear about No, don't go, Mr. Swan. Please, not while I'm concentrating. Now, let me see. Christopher Swan, born one day... I can't quite make that out. In March 1908. Birthplace, the Manor House, Lower Orchard, Bellingdon near Chasm Bucks. 1940, removed to London, a choir bookshop. Father and mother killed in Blitz. It's a pity, Mr. Swan. You, however, inherit 50,000 pounds, right? Yes, every bit of it. But um, would it be impertinent to point out that you had access to this information in several publications? (laughs) Not one bit impertinent, Mr. Swan. But tell me, in which publication could I have learned that on the 9th of November this year you will be hanged by the neck until dead? I... I beg your pardon? (laughs) And don't look so taken aback, my friend. The gift of prophecy, nothing more. Ability to foresee the future. You, you, you charlatan. Do you seriously expect me to believe... That you'll be hanged. Of course I don't expect you to believe it, Mr. Swan. Any more than you believed my first prophecy about your marriage. But you will be hanged, Mr. Swan. Pity, really a pity. On the morning of November 9th, hang by the neck until you are dead. For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Ronald Coleman in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hey there, Harlow. Heard you played Truth or Consequences at a big Hollywood party. Sure. They asked me to tell the truth, and naturally I did. I said, friends, those Autolite resistor spark plugs always give a star performance. Smoother idling, better performance on leaner gas mixtures... And actually save gas. Why, they're bigger box office than a movie star. Hollywood stood for that. Well, I had to tell the truth. Wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs are the spark plugs of today and the future. 
Yep, I said, more men go for Autolite resistor spark plugs than for glamorous movie stars. So switch from old narrow gap plugs yeah, to... They must have loved you. There I was, telling the truth, and I had to take the consequences, too. Oh, you did? Yeah, they threw me into the swimming pool. <laughs> well, it's duck, Harlow. Suspense is on. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Ronald Coleman as Christopher Swan in Noose of Coincidence. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Good morning, Mr. Swan. And a good morning to you, Constable. Well, I hope it's better than the night I had. Oh, fair horrible, that's what it was. Oh, Mr. Swan, do you have any books that talk about spirits? Oh, yes, sir. Some very fine ones. Uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, Then there's the American psychologist William James. That's an odd coincidence. That's the man I'm reading now. There you are. William James, The Will to Believe. Oh, it ain't the believing that bothers me. It's the will to leave it in the bottle. The the bottle? Spirits, Mr. Swan. Ooh, last night. Oh, 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 I beg your pardon, Constable. You know, my mind is so set upon a certain... Well, let's see now. Ah, spirits, spirituous, here we are. Spiritus frumenti. Christopher! Oh, heavens. When will you ever clean this filthy back room? I'll be there in half a moment, Margaret. Not in half a moment, now. Oh, she does have a voice that carries, don't she, Mr. Swan? I suppose you just browse along that shelf, Constable, and help yourself to whatever you like. Look at this place, look at it. Nothing but old books. Dickens, Thackeray, Victor Hugo. Filthy nonsense, filthy nonsense. Oh, these are rare editions, Margaret. Please don't handle them like that. I'll handle them as they deserve. I'll tear them or burn them or fling them about. Now, Margaret, Ma- Margaret, how dare you? It happens that I love this shop and the things in it. You'd like to die here. What? You said so in your sleep last night. I wish I were dead. That's what I heard you say. I don't know what's come over you, Christopher. Moody all the time. Sulking, sulking, sulking. Pity you feel so sorry for yourself. Margaret, please. Constable Smithers can hear every word. Let him. Let everybody hear. I've nothing to hide. I never dream about suicide. I made a mistake when I married you, but I'm trying to make the best of it. Pity you can't do the same. Pity you feel there's only one way out. Yes, a pity. 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 The quiet was gone. The gentle... Thoughtful, quiet. A bookshop should be a peaceful place. I didn't remember dreaming about suicide, but I suppose I had such dreams. A man wants peace, even if it's only the peace of the grave. Oh, good morning. Good morning. I wonder if you have St. Moore by D.H. Lawrence? I believe published by Heinemann. Yes, Heinemann does publish, Lawrence. But I'm afraid we don't have... Uh, If you'll just step over here... There's been quite a demand for Lawrence lately, and with books in short supply... I know. Uh, let me see. St. Moore, St. Moore, St. There's one copy of Sons and Lovers, one gypsy. Uh, no, no, I'm afraid we're out. May I order it for you? No, I really prefer to look for it. It's a good excuse to go tramping about, prowling through bookshops. Do you like bookshops? Oh, yes. Well, I'm glad. Why? Oh, nothing. I'm simply glad. I, uh, I'm sorry not to have had your book. I'll find it. Thank you so much. Uh, you, you might try the, the Ken bookshop near Victoria Station. Thank you, I will. Oh, another idea. Uh, suppose you leave your name and telephone number, and then I'd be able to ring you up if you should happen to come in. Oh, would you be good enough to do that? My name is Anne Stevens. Mrs. Anne Stevens? No, Miss Anne Stevens. Bayswater 3210. Christopher! Miss Ann Stevens had red hair, too. But not simply orange red like Margaret's. Her hair was like burnished copper, all warm and bright down to her shoulders. And when she walked in the sunlight, it seemed to be splashed with gold. And I thought to myself, it's probably fragrant and soft to touch. It was only a few days later I met her again in crowded Hyde Park. And what does he say to us? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, Why, Miss Stevens, I am sorry. Well, no, I'm not, really. I mean, I... Hello. 
Did I hurt you? Of course not. It's Mr. Swan, isn't it? Yes. You have a remarkable memory for faces. No more than you. You remembered me. Oh, but that's different. I've thought about you. Did you? How nice. I'm um, trying to find a copy of Sin Moore. You know, you remember that that's what you wanted. Oh, I'm so sorry. I did find a copy that same day at the Ken bookshop, thanks to your advice. Oh. It's a lovely work. I haven't read it. Really? Oh, Mr. Swan, let me give it to you. That is so you could read it. I'll bring it to your shop. Uh, suppose you bring it to me here. Right here, to this very spot. Good. Tomorrow, same time. Tomorrow, same time. And I'll bring something I want you to read. There were many tomorrows, but never enough of them. We talked and walked and spent wonderful hours together. And so many of them were utterly silent because it wasn't necessary to talk. Because when you know someone deeply in your heart and a red-haired woman, so that charlatan with my name could look into the future. But there were two red-haired women, and I'd met the wrong one first. He came to the shop again late in the autumn, well, good morning, Mr. Swan. Still alive, I see. Still alive? Yes, naturally. Until November 9th. That was my prediction, Mr. Swan. Pity, pity. Oh, what is it you want of me, please? Why do you try to impress me? I don't believe a word you say. You must know the that. The prophet who gazes into the future, Mr. Swan, knows many things. Bitter things. And he knows more than anything else how we struggle against that which is ordained and which we cannot change. Ah, rot. <laughs> if you say so. Have you a bit of paper, please? Just a bit of paper, whatever's above. You mean to write on or uh, to wrap something? No, to write a curious phrase that's been running through my mind. Oh, there, that there tablet, that will do. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Swan. Here, here. Uh, here, here. I'm writing down a bit from a book. You're a bookman. Perhaps you can tell me what book it's from. Yeah. Uh, wasn't like a man at all to her. Uh, there we are. Just read it aloud, please. Huh? She could not believe it what was actually happening. When she was dancing in the afternoon at Claridge's or in the evening at the Carlton, sliding about with some suave young man who wasn't like a man at all to her. Well, Mr. Swan. I recognize it. What about it? Huh. It's from a novel by D.H. Lawrence, a novel called St. Moore. It appears somewhere in the in the first third of the book. Yes, how curious. I seem to see it written on the flyleaf for the book. Hey, hey, wait, now I seem to see something beneath it. Oh, this is absurd. In the same feminine hand, a delightful hand, the words, you see, I love you, Anne. Is that correct, Mr. Swan? Get out of here. <laughs> that book seems to be under the papers in the left-hand bottom drawer of your desk. Mr. Swan, how can you be so indiscreet? Oh, get out. Uh, suppose Margaret should find it. Uh, trouble, Mr. Swan. Trouble. What did this mean? How could he know what Anne had written in that book? Was she in league with him? She couldn't be. Not Anne. And yet, I had fallen in love with her, a red-haired woman, as he had prophesied. The answer came soon enough. Con Christopher, Constable Smithers is in the shop. Oh, is he browsing, buying, or chatting? He wants a copy of a book called St. Maur. Constable Smithers wishes to read St. Maur? By D.H. Lawrence. To begin with, I don't believe he had ever heard of it. Second, we haven't had a copy for ages. You should take more pains with your inventory, Christopher. There's a copy right there in the bottom left-hand drawer of your desk. Oh, no, there's not. I say there is. And we'll have to sell it second-hand. Some lovesick girl's written something on the flyleaf. You know Constable Smithers doesn't want that book, Margaret. Of course he doesn't. I didn't think so. And there's no copy of St. Maur in the desk. There we differ. Well, look for yourself. Thank you. I will... And what do you call this? Oh, but it's, it's impossible. Impossible, is it? And didn't I find it here myself this morning? And didn't I read the inscription? 
You put it there yourself. Oh, now I know you've gone mad. I only suspected it before. Yesterday, the book was in that drawer when Swan predicted that you'd find it there. But I took it out and hid it upstairs in my bedroom. You returned it to the drawer to make his prediction come true. <laughs> I didn't sleep well that night. It was the night of November the 8th. Many things had become clear. Margaret knew this fellow Swan, had known him before I met her. Between them, they had arranged his prophecies, the marriage, then the business of the book. This duplicity, this plot against me, was relieved only by one thing. Anne was not in league with Swan, and she did love me. I remember thinking, as I drifted into sleep, that if I could survive the next 24 hours, I would be safe and could free myself for Anne. When I awoke, I found my hands tied to a bedpost with a silk scarf and Margaret standing at the window that's above the entrance to the shop. Mr. Swan stood on a chair at the clothes cupboard. He was twisting a large hook into the top of the door frame. Good morning, my boy. It's the 9th of November. Oh, your prophecy. Uh, Christopher Swan, hanged by the neck. Until dead. Well, you might show some fright, at least some surprise. I'm too filled with loathing for you both. So you're going to... to murder me? <laughs> what a frightful idea. No, 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 you're going to commit suicide. Pity. Don't talk to him, Kit. Get it done with. Oh, right. yes, Maggie, surely. Maggie is my sister, Mr. Swan. I knew there was some relationship between you. You have the same tricks of expression. You use the word pity so often... There's not much pity in either of you, is there? It was a little, Mr. Swan, but it's not stronger than 50,000 pounds. <laughs> there we are. Do you think that hook will hold, Mr. Swan? Oh, come to the point. You don't uh, really intend to murder me. Uh, what is it you want? <laughs> Maggie, he thinks we're only pretending. Hurry, will you? It's almost time. Oh, poor Maggie. I hope her share of your fortune will console her. Will it console you, Maggie? Oh, shut up. <laughs> Maggie's having a touch of nerves. Isn't that silly, Mr. Swan? There's no danger to us in this. So many of your customers have heard you threaten to commit suicide. Oh, I doubt if one ever did. Oh, they think they did, Mr. Swan. That's all that matters. Do you realize how many times Maggie has shouted that information from the back of the shop? Constable Smithers heard it. Nevertheless, he knows me better than to believe... Oh, does I'm... he? <laughs> Shall I tell you what Constable Smithers will say to the coroner? <laughs> He'll say, Yaldy would do himself in some day. Yaldy all the time from the day they was married. And there he swung, sir, with his face all black, his eyes bugged out. Stop it! <laughs> You're too fond of talking. You'll get us into trouble. Absurd. <laughs> Margaret, you, you actually married me with this day in mind? Of course I did. And you're really going to to kill me? That's the plan. And I'm sorry there isn't enough of a drop to do the thing quickly, old man. You'll be struggling for quite a bit. Yes, I know you'll both enjoy watching me. No, not Maggie. No. Maggie's watching for the constable to turn the corner on his rounds. And then she's going to scuttle down the stairs while I do the job, lock the door from the inside, slip through the trap door in the cupboard, and away like St. Nicholas over the rooftops. <laughs> then she'll say to him, Constable, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. <laughs> there he is, Kit, huh? at the corner. Oh, he stopped to talk. Uh, well, are you ready, Mr. Swan? Because here you go. Oh, don't come at me with that noose. Uh, I can still kick. I can shout. No, the walls are thick, my friend. That's why you bought this house. They were built to endure. I told you to chloroform him. Oh, don't be stupid. Chloroform these traces. You wanted him conscious, so he could know how clever you are, always acting. You and your silly November 9th. No, oh, will you stop yammering? The constable must be halfway down the street. He's still at the corner. Ah. You better wait. Better, better wait till he comes this way, Margaret. They'll say you had time to do it if he finds me cold. Oh, thank you, Christopher. That's excellent advice. He's not really pleased, Margaret. Look at him. He wants you to be caught. <laughs> Christopher, I'm disappointed. What childish tactics. Is it, Swan? <laughs> is it? Look at him, Margaret. That struck home. It struck home. Oh, I think I'll have to close your mouth, my friend. Oh, not <laughs> while I can kick. Maggie, throw yourself across his legs. Don't give in, Margaret. Remember, you face the constable. He gets away over the rooftop. Maggie, are you in a trance? Throw yourself across his legs. No. Maggie, I can't get at him. I don't care. I don't like oh, it. It's too late to think about that. 
Where's the constable? If you won't help me here, get back to that window. No, he's right. Bravo, Margaret. I'm the one who has to go down to Smithers and establish an alibi. Yes. I'm the uh, one who'll have to answer all their questions. That's right. And where will you be? Where will you be? Safe. Who knows about you? Yes, and when they hang you for murdering me, he'll inherit the loot. He'll get it all. Oh, close your trap. No. I haven't any protection. You hold all the cards. Of course he does. Maggie, you're going to ruin everything. Don't you trust your own flesh and blood? No. Get back to your post. Let go of me. Back to the window. I'll kill you both. Let That's it, Iris. Fight him. Fight him. Don't push me. Don't push me. I can push too. Push. I can push. Oh. Oh, Kit. Kit. Oh. It's queer goings on, sir, you being bound to the bed like this and him breaking through the window and then hanging from the sign. You'll have to answer some questions, Mrs. Swan. Hanging from the sign? I killed him. I killed him. Yes, and I saw it happen. Saw him smash through the window and come tumbling down and catch his Adam's apple right in the very crook of the elbow where the sparrows build a nest every spring. Right in the very crook. And there he swung, caught fast, Mr. Swan. Ah, it was horrible, sir. His face black and his eyes bugged out. Stop it, oh, stop it. Another prophecy come true. What's that, Mr. Swan? I think he could foretell the future. I believe he could. November the 9th. Christopher Swan hanged by the neck until dead. Only he had the wrong Christopher Swan. <laughs> Thank you, Ronald Coleman, for a splendid performance. Oh, Mr. Coleman, would you listen to a sound effect with us for a moment? Oh, why, certainly, Mr. Wilcox. Okay, boys. <laughs> Mr. Coleman, would you say that sounds like Jack Benny's Maxwell? Yes, I'd say there's a great similarity. Well, just listen to what Jack Benny's old Maxwell might sound like if it had new Autolite resistor spark plugs and a complete Autolite ignition system. <laughs> Mr. Wilcox... If I had a set of those Autolite spark plugs around the house, sooner or later, Benny would borrow them. And then perhaps we'd be spared that awful racket. <laughs> well, we'll see what we can do, Mr. Coleman. Friends, Autolite resistor spark plugs are made by Autolite men who make over 400 products for cars, trucks, airplanes, and boats in 28 Autolite plants from coast to coast. Yes, sir, and Autolite also makes complete electrical systems for many makes of America's finest cars. Batteries, spark plugs, generators, starting motors, coils, distributors. All ignition engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So folks, don't accept electrical parts that are supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. <laughs> Now here again is Mr. Ronald Coleman. It's always an interesting and pleasant experience to appear on suspense, and especially when I can work with such a fine company of actors. Next week, we're all in for a special treat when radio's outstanding theater of thrills presents Edmund Gwen in a story called Murder in Black and White, another gripping study in... Suspense. Tonight's play was written by William Fifield and adapted for suspense by Herb Meadow. Music was composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. In the coming weeks, suspense will present such stars as Betty Grable, Mickey Rooney, Bob Hope, and many others. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Next Thursday, same time, hear Edmund Gwen in Murder in Black and White. Buy Autolite resistor spark plugs, Autolite stay-full batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. Here's great news. Suspense on television may be seen in many parts of the country every Tuesday night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>